uh, East Coast about, free. East Coast yeah. free. There you go. <laughs> or, or, or just, you know, I don't know. It, it blows me away how fast we've grown, though. I mean, when I was in high oh. school, we had 800,000, 700,000 people, and now we're at 1.7 million. And so it's growing quick. And continues to grow. Kelton, of course, is joining us from Idaho Fish and Game. And I had a conversation, in fact, the other day with Randy Staples, uh, the, the newspaper fellow. Oh, yeah. And we talked a little bit about eastern Idaho and having gone over the weekend to visit there. And you, you realize that the development that's going on, not only in places in the valleys out there, but then even in, in Wyoming, what used to be sleepy little towns like Alpine is becoming, uh, it's going to be the next Jackson Hole. Oh, it's... Houses going up everywhere. Yeah, and it just, I, I don't know. I have a rough time watching things change. I even look at some, some of the areas near where I grew up, and I mean, it's really, really rural over there uh, because it's 35 miles to a grocery store. But you're starting to see these little communities or people looking to escape pop up just, you know, 15, 20 miles away from there because it's a little closer to the grocery store. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't know, I'd like to retire over there myself just to, but if it turns into a big, I, I, I'm just not a tourist town fan. And yeah. So it's it, nice to look at, but you don't want to live there. No. Um, Lived lived around them up in Montana and stuff like that, and it's just it, I like. I mean, Twin Falls is awesome, and the rural areas around here are great. It's just it's growing really fast, and it's good for the economy, but it's uh, it's tough on me. <laughs> well, you know, you, you, the people from in places like uh, Elko who will, or Wells who will drive to Twin Falls to shop, uh, but they do it only once a month. You yeah. see, that's so you don't have to worry about living fifty miles from a grocery store if you you don't. But they know how to do this. It's yeah. the the people who are. Who've grown up having a grocery store around the corner that have to be, yep, close that, by. And that's what my mother would do. Every two weeks to every four weeks, would she'd run into, you know, sixty miles away to the bigger town, get, run into Pocatello to get to really load up on groceries, and then, yeah, if and you if you needed milk, you went and milked the cow. <laughs> 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 and there were a lot of things you could find out in the forest. Yeah. Uh, hey, speaking of eastern Idaho, you've got a note here on plague. And I was just talking about kitty cats, in fact, uh, off air just before we went to the break before 9 o'clock news. And, in fact, it's uh, it's being spread in, in feral cat populations. Well, domestic cat populations. I mean, pretty much any cat is subject to getting the plague right now. I mean, we've had cats that have died in Clark County, which is up by Mud Lake, Territon, up in that country. And then you've also had a cat that died over in Elmore County, which is just, you know, to the... Uh, to the west of us here and what happens is we get when you get really hot hot years you get high populations of uh, burrowing critters um, the plague pops up and this is one of those years that we're having a lot of uh, plague show up I guess how you'd say it Um, I guess my warning here is is the reason cats get is because they hunt these critters and they kill them and then they get them get it Um, we've got a lot of folks around here that are they're avid campers and, and like to get in the outdoors. I just want to warn people, don't be feeding the chipmunks and squirrels and marmots and think, yellow-bellied marmots, rock chucks, um, in camp. Um, because if you, it, you can get uh, a flea from them, uh, you're petting them or anything like that, you can pick up the plague. We haven't had plague. Uh, we've only had five cases of plague since the 40s, and the last ones were in the 90s. Um, but... It's one of those years that the plague is really showing up, and we just want to uh, have people, uh, if they see a large population or s- more than five dead marmots in an area that didn't die from a bullet wound, you know, <laughs> that uh, or ground squirrels um, in an area, because it's is very prevalent in those type of populations. If you see that, please contact us or the, or the uh, health department so that we are aware of that going on in that area so that we can uh, spread the warning a little bit more. But right now, i just be cautious um, when you're out and about and not not be trying to catch the little buggers. Clearly, we're not at an epidemic level, so we don't want it to go there. If we can control no. it right now the way it is, it's not going to be a threat. Well, and, and, we just, and we don't want people to freak out. I mean, moms, your kids aren't going to get this from the dirt. I mean, they can go out and play in the dirt, play mm-hmm. in the creek and stuff like that. Is, uh, but that it... It's always prevalent in in voles and mice and 
uh, ground squirrels and, and gophers and things like that because they're a burrowing animal. It's usually transmitted through blood with fleas. And so it's somewhere in Idaho all the time. I mean, people think the bubonic plague was, it, it was eliminate. Well, it's not. Um, and so, and it is carried through burrowing animals. So just be cautious and uh, uh, be aware. You have a you have a note here on the list today about big game draw results, and I know we had a lot of calls about this the last couple of months when you've been in with us. We have, uh, and I just wanted to tell folks they haven't come out yet, <laughs> and so but they will be coming out. I'm guessing we we will have you notified by the first of July, and I'm just betting that next week sometime they come out, uh, probably closer to the end of the week. But the way you can find out whether you drew. And I guess the reason I'm, I'm trying to do this is because we just get inundated with phone calls um, right now. People were probably getting 50 phone calls a day. as the draw results out and the draw results out. Um, go to the website, fishinggame.idaho.gov. Click on draw results. Have your hunting license there. You can put your name uh, in there. But the deer, elk, and antelope are not up yet. But that's the easiest way to get the draw, draw results earlier is go, you get, you can access it on your cell phone. You, um, you can get on a home computer and you run to the county library here and they've got access to the internet and, and you can look them up that way. But probably starting sometime at the end of next week, I'm guessing. And then you've got super hunt winners, which is sort of related. I'm mean, different, different thing, but a uh, similar idea is that uh, in, in a lot of these people, this is this, a good program for the state, even though some hunters don't like it. It's good for the state's bottom line. You know, well, and it's not really the bottom line. It, I mean, it is. It's really good. The super hunt is we had 4,000, I mean, 44,767 people that applied for super tags. Um, that money goes directly to Access Yes, which is a program where we pay landowners. Like we buy Access on the Snake River that uh, lets people go through private property on boat launches that there's no access for 10, 15 miles, both directions. So we pay for access there. We pay for access for, uh, on, uh, hunting pro I mean, for, uh, private land in 49, 48, 54, all our hunting units around us that typically what we're looking for is we have a board that goes in and they look at all the, all the people that su submit possibilities for us to purchase access on and then we try to get the best bang for the buck. If it opens access to a forest service area or a forest area, BLM area, through their private property, or if they've got really good private property, parts of 47 would have a really rough time hunting because there's so much of it's a private without this program. So it, it's a huge program. But I wanted to tell folks we had uh, uh, deer is always the most popular. We had 15,936 applicants for the eight deer tags. Um, four went to Idaho residents, two went to Utah, one went to a guy from, or somebody from Mexico and one from California elk. We had 14,497 applications for the eight tags. Five went to Idaho, two to California, one to Arizona pronghorn, um, 300, uh, 3,461 people applied for those tags. Three went to Idaho, one to California, one to Oregon, one to Wisconsin, one to Washington, one to Utah. Um, then we had one moose tag that was lucky enough to be drawn. Uh, there were 7,254 people that put in for that tag and one, it went to Montana and then the divorce package, I like to call it the super combo hunt <laughs> where you get a deer, elk, antelope, and moose tag. We had 3,619 entries for that. And that went to someone from Idaho. And so we had a lot of, uh, a lot of put, folks that put in, I know the drawing odds are long, but that money goes to a really good cause. It opens access for all hunters in Idaho. And so we've got another drawing coming up August uh, 10th. We'll have two elk tags, two deer tags, two pronghorn tags, one moose tag, and another super combo hunt. And so uh, the winner will be notified on August 20th. So if you're interested in doing that, it's about 650 an app for uh, the deer and elk. Well, for just the, the singles and the combo, the super combo, somewhere between 20 and 25 and uh, uh, application, but goes to a great cause. I had a, a TV show on this morning before I drove into work. I was having my coffee and listening to it while I was in the kitchen, and somebody 
was complaining about uh, being married to a fellow who spent way too much time hunting and fishing and, and was and looking for advice what what she should do and I thought well number one stop nagging maybe he'd stay home <laughs> <laughs> but it is true you have to have an understanding spouse if you're going to be doing all of these things oh, well you do and I you know I I must uh, give my wife kudos because I I probably do more than my fair share but she knew what it was before and. This time of year, I I've really given up my fishing because I'm I like to uh, hunt so much in the fall, and so I try to get all my honeydews and things done during the summer. And then my wife is also taking up hunting with me, and so she goes out and it it, it makes it very enjoyable. And um, but no, I, I can understand that by the end of hunting season, my wife is going well. How many more weeks are left? <laughs> How many more trips are left? And it's like, well, just a few. <laughs> so like I, I you know, had a girlfriend, and she went to a baseball game with me one time and seemed to have a good time. She didn't say she didn't, and I thought, this is going to be good. good. And then I got tickets again, and she said, take my brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she, she can act once. She couldn't act twice. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna, you mentioned pronghorn, and we got about a minute before the next break, but if we could just maybe get into this. Uh, note you have here, Trapping Pronghorn. Well, we have. We've had a neat project going for the last couple of years up in, uh, uh, now I'm forgetting the name, uh, Fairfield, up north here. And what we do is we go in and we trap pronghorn fawns and we put radio collars on them. Um, it's kind of interesting. You would never guess that a three-day-old pronghorn can outrun a 21 year old kid you know because we get a lot of these younger uh, technicians out there to help us run them down because a, a three-day-old fawn can run down a 50 year old pretty quick <laughs> at least yeah. my me yeah. you know and so uh but we go up and we put a radio collar on them and what we're trying to do is just see what type of nu uh, nutrition it takes to, we've got a really high fawn survival up in the fairfield area and so we're trying to see what's going on with their diet um what their cause of mortality is. We've got some technicians that spend every day up there that um, we've got close to 50 pronghorn that are, are radio collared up in that area, and they will uh, check them every day to see um, if they die or if they're still alive, and if they're if one of them dies, we can get in there quick to determine what the its mortality was caused by. We've got more with Kelton Hatch. We can talk more about it after. Sure. And, of course, he'll take some of your telephone calls as well, as he usually does, at 736-0300. He's here from Idaho Fish and Game. And right now it's 20 minutes after 9 o'clock, and we've got uh, 53, or close enough. Joining us in the studio this hour, Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game. He joins us on a monthly basis, sometimes uh, more frequently, if we have something that comes up that uh, we need to pass along to the public quickly. Bill Colley with you as well at 923 on News Radio 1310 KLIX. And NewsRadio1310.com, it's 52. Uh, we were talking about trapping pronghorn, and we got started, but then the break came along. You've got a bit more on that, I know. Well, I was just going to tell you, so that people kind of understand what's going on with these, uh, they're born at less than 10 pounds, pronghorn fawns are, so they're pretty small. And uh, they're, they're predated by coyotes, bobcats, uh, golden eagles. Are, are typical predators that will take them. Um, and through this radio collar work, we can uh, we can really determine what's going on with them, what type of feed that they need, and hopefully we'll be able to take this research and be able to use it in other portions of the state to hope, hopefully increase and, and strengthen our pronghorn populations elsewhere too. I'm going to jump down to the bottom of the list for a minute, and then we'll go back to the others because I was telling you off air uh, when I was up at the uh, the Palisades Dam on Saturday, uh, it was only about 60 degrees. It was nice. There wasn't really much of a breeze, but the fisher I was talking to a fisherman who was unhappy with the weather, and I thought this is this should be perfect fishing weather. It, it, it you know right now it is, um, and I'm surprised too over there in Palisades it, it because I mean your your cold water fish. I know that the the South Fork. I mean it's a pretty controlled flow, and they've been having an incredible time over there. Um, from all the, my friends, I've got a, growing up over in that area, I get, still keep in communication with a lot of my family and friends over there, and, and they've been fishing really well on, on the South Fork. Um, one of the few rivers in the state that are, you know, you've got Silver Creek that's a spring-fed creek, and um, it's been fishing really well. Uh, but a lot of our other streams, uh, you know, the Jarbridge, the Bruno, uh, 
Rock Creek, any of these up in the canyons and stuff are just running so hot and muddy right now that it, it's hard to do much good. But Salmon Falls Creek has really k- turned on. Um, the walleye fishing's been really good. Uh, they've been catching several other species of fish. You know, early on we had a really good uh, push on on trout at Walcott and uh, Salmon Falls Creek. That's slowing down a little bit. Salmon Falls Creek's still fishing pretty good. But now bass are starting to come on. Uh, my Walcott and you know for lake fishing right now is a great time to get out there and do it uh, uh, Oakley Reservoir has been fishing really well and a lot of my uh, con- our friends that are uh, hardcore walleyers you know one of my buddies uh, he- he's going to be out there all week Bob will be and he'll take his camper out there and he- this is when he starts going and he fishes all night that's when he likes to chase the big walleye and um so it's that time of year to get out and enjoy the weather and don't feed the chipmunks or squirrels <laughs> and catch some fish. Do you, do you, do you favor fishing after dark? Uh, for walleye, for walleye is, um, and you know, I, I talk as if I'm an expert, this is stuff that I've acquired. I've only caught one while I'm just, I talk about fishing. I don't do a ton of fishing. I take about 3,900 kids fishing. Uh, through the trout in the classroom, and I think that may uh, take some of the fun out of it for me. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> and so, and I, I still run my kids around and, and get them fishing, but, um, you know, I try to pick that up from, we, we talk to a lot of different sportsmen and try to try to be familiar with, with it, but, uh, you know, Bob, he, he's, he's really avid. He's a good friend, and his favorite time to chase big walleyes all night. We have a caller with us, and caller, you're on the air with Kelton Hatch from Idaho Fish and Game at 927. I think you guys at the Idaho Fish and Game are doing an excellent job here in the state of Idaho, managing the fish and game, and uh, I think uh, Idaho hunters really should be proud of the job you guys are doing. I do see a threat coming, though, off uh, access to federal property for hunting. I, You know, it just... Uh, you know, I just think it's something that's looming there, and I hope you guys keep your eyes on it. And, and uh, but just keep up the good work, especially your law enforcement guys. They got a really tough job. Uh, poaching, I think, is a big problem in this state, and I, I think they're doing a good job with it. Thank well, you. thank you. I greatly appreciate all that. That was nice to hear. In fact, we'll get into a little discussion on uh, poaching in the next half hour mm-hmm. uh, because uh, that is an issue, and. Uh, you know, you get a call like that. You're always waiting for the butt, but the butt wasn't a criticism of anything you're doing. No, and and I appreciate it. And you know, that's always something that concerns me. People people in Idaho love their public lands. Um, we're very blessed to have 68 percent of the state as public lands because that's what makes us different from everywhere else. Uh, you know, Wyoming, a little bit of Montana. You know, you get on the east side of Montana, it's almost all public. I mean, private, um, Wyoming, Nevada, we can go hunting in 60 per- plus percent of the state without saying, Hey, can I go hunt on your property? If you go to Texas, you don't do that. There's five acres down there. Maybe that's, you know, public ground. We're very, very, very fortunate to have, uh, you know, uh, it blows people away. I was talking to some guys from back East the other day and they're sitting here talking about, he goes, you guys have, uh, uh, camping, you can camp anywhere. We can only camp in campgrounds. He goes, we've never heard of this. And I'm sitting here going, why would you want to camp in the campground? Because that's more crowded than the neighborhood I live in as a campground, you know? And so I never even thought about that, but we're very fortunate. <laughs> we got more with Kelton Hatch coming up from Idaho Fish and Game and more of your telephone calls too as well. It's coming up on 930. It's 52. Bill Cowley with you too on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Kelton Hatch joins us periodically from, uh, we'll say periodically because sometimes it's more than once a month, on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 933 and we have 52. Bill Colley with you as well on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. A telephone number 736 0300. And uh, a, pro, a caller brought up the poaching, and uh, you've got a note on Bighorn being poached. Uh, and we've had some other issues too recently, I know, that have come up over the last six months or so. and you know, you can't you can't be everywhere all at once. But sometimes people see things. Yeah, well, and that's and that's where we get ninety five percent of our cases, or ninety percent is from 
the public um, reporting things that they see that's going on. You know, um, this case is, is uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up that this this was uh, this is a sad case over in uh, Idaho County courthouse where we had a gentleman out of Nampa that uh, took advantage of. Uh, just spotting a bighorn sheep along the river and he shot it um some people told us about it uh we were able to get there before uh before he'd got the game animal out he ended up getting uh he received 30 days in jail a ten thousand dollar civil penalty and fines and court costs and uh oh and and court costs for 753 dollars and then he received uh he's four years probation he didn't have to spend the 30 days. I think he had like 15 that he ended up actually spending that, but he was put on probation for the rest of them. But then he had a mandatory license revocation for lifetime. And just so people understand what that really means is we're in a compact with like 36, 38 other states. And so if you lose your license in any one of those states, you cannot purchase a license in any of the other states. Um, and so it in basically removes your hunting privileges from the entire west there's a few uh, states i mean places back east that um still haven't uh joined the compact but um you know and, and it was due to uh sportsmen that were willing to get involved and i want to just give people a phone number here um if you see anything going on i mean we've had a lot of incidences with sturgeon in the Snake River, which which is a tough one for me because we don't have we only have one small stretch that we have any natural reproduction of sturgeon, and uh, we we keep losing them. We have uh, every we find deer with antlers removed, uh, and we we have several different cases that are going on all the time in the Magic Valley. But if people could give us a call at one eight hundred six three two five nine 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 if they see something going on uh, that's our cap hotline you can remain anonymous and still get a cash reward but uh just keep your eyes and ears open and, and help the wildlife in the area and, and i don't want to over dramatize it like every animal dies but we do have we do have poaching that that, that goes on um i don't know that i'd call it an ep epidemic but there is still enough that we need to get a handle on it Want to point out a telephone number to reach this program, 7360300. Caller, I'll get to you in just a moment. I just have a note from our newsroom. Uh, in Twin Falls, they have an issue with a water main, apparently at Falls Avenue and Lincoln Street. And uh, so you're urged to be, uh, well, avoid that area, that intersection, if you can, in the next few hours. Also, we're going to be back into the 90 degree range next week with our temperatures. And if you have not yet had a little service done to your air conditioner to get it up and running efficiently, you need to give the pros a call at Ramsey Heating and Electric in, in Burley. Make sure the job is done right the first time and set yourself up for a great summer. You can see Ramsey Heating and Electric at 2600 Overland Avenue in Burley or telephone 678-0459. That's Ramsey Heating and Electric where they sell warm winters and cool summers. Ramsey Heating and Electric. And you're up next. You're on the air with Kelton Hatch on KLIX. Kelton, um... Calling um, a couple years back, we had an instance where uh, there was a depredation hunt going on during the uh, archery hunt up in the Pioneer Unit. Yep. Um, have you guys came up with a solution where you're going to be able to advise the bow hunters yet? We're um, of these instances going on, maybe on the website, a little bulletin board or something. Yes. What we're what we're working, and I appreciate the call. That's one of those things that has been just to to help people know what's going on is. When we have issues with uh, too many elk getting in alfalfa fields and uh, grain fields and corn fields and stuff, we had set up some green field hunts. And a lot of those start um, in August, but the pro and they're within a mile of the cultivated fields or uh, fields that people are growing crops in. The biggest issue is, and it, it was it's always been a it's a concern to us is because we have archers that start on August 31st in most of these units. And so it's just not safe for us to have the rifles and the archers out there uh, because we're more the the archers are taking advantage of these animals near the agriculture fields, which is a really good place to go. And so what he's talking about is trying to uh, uh, let people know when we have these dep different type of depredation hunts and stuff going on. What we do is I want you to go to our Facebook page. It's uh, 
It's at Magic Valley Facebook. Uh, or go to Facebook, fa- I guess it's Facebook, and then you go to Magic Valley Fishing Game. And we try to publish all of those type of things on there. We have quite an active Facebook site to let people know what's going on in, in, in our region. And then also, um, if you want to be on our email list, you can call us at the Magic Valley office at uh, 324-4359, and we'll get you on an email list. Uh, we've got more with Kelton Hatch coming up. In fact, going to talk about some fishing events as well as a little public input uh, on education, a specific type of education. That's ahead in just a couple of minutes. Our guest in the studio is Kelton Hatch. He's here from Idaho Fish and Game. He joins us on a monthly basis, sometimes more often. If we have a big event coming up, it's uh, 944, 53 right now. Bill Colley, too, on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Uh, public input on trapper education. Trapper education. I I failed to put on our, uh, to mention to you earlier on uh, and youth hunts. What we're uh, what we're trying to do right now is we've got a, a mandatory trapper education class that was it's House Bill 378. It was passed in the legislature in 2000, 2016. Um, we're trying to create the format for it. Um, so if you go to our website fishinggame.idaho.gov um, you can read more about it on the press releases there because we have a new, we put out press releases every week on different happenings on that website. And then we're also trying to receive input on making youth hunts easier, uh, to apply for, to, uh, understand, try to, I mean, right now we've got the, our problem <laughs> One of our major problems here, and everybody's aware of it, is um, our, our regulations are very complicated. And I'll be the first to admit it. It about drives me nuts because I thought that I had them memorized until the next year. And then something's changed. And I'm going, when did they change that? You know. And so um, we understand that we've just, I mean, there's 130 pages of, of regulations and when I was a kid, you know, there's one fold-out page of regulations for all for everything. So things have got a little more complicated, but um, we're trying to get some input from the public on what they'd like to see on these youth hunts and and how they'd like to see them structured and maybe some ages and that we're looking at. And so go on, fill those paper that paper out. I mean, it, it is the the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So the more people that vote like you do or, or mention stuff on there and and put your comments in there. We we read every one of those comments. We may get, you know, 5,000 uh, people that write in on stuff or more. And we'll sit down and we'll read all of those. They they try to categorize them. And the some of the really good ideas, that's where we, you know, we, we come up with new changes for the regs and, uh, and that's one of the reasons the regs are so thick is because we have so many different types of things going on right now. And uh, But go on there on fishinggame.idaho.gov and click on uh, um, our, our the feedback and you can uh, talk to us about what you'd like to see in Trapper's Head and, and Youth Hunts. Got a couple of other items we've got to mention while Kelton's here. But in the meantime, just it's 946 and 53. And I'd like to remind people that Dr. Eric F. Jones was a guest on the program a few weeks ago with us and said he had great response. He uses a holistic, uh, I've got to get this right, systemic approach. Because sometimes that word changes in when I when I pronounce it versus what I'm trying to read, to wellness. He's been practicing since, uh, since 1993. He's got master's and doctorate degrees in marriage and family therapy. Dr. Jones uses methods of alternative healing such as naturopathy, medicinal herbs, nutrition, sound waves, intellectual cognitive self-regulation, and naprathy to help remedy and manage mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual challenges. And he's looking for new patients with weekend appointments. That would be Saturday, we should point out, and sometimes nightside available. You can call him at 208-731-7178 and his Facebook page, Eric F. Jones, Ph.D., Mental Health and Wellness Therapist. Two items you've got left on uh, on the agenda for today. Uh, Kelton Hatch in studio with us at News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Transfer tags. Uh, for people out there who probably don't know a lot about fish and game, what exactly is that? Well, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I thought most people knew about this, but I'm finding that I didn't do my job very well to get the information out there. So that's why we're here talking to you, Bill. Um, <laughs> so adults, like 
if you were if you had a uh, a grandson or granddaughter here um or child ages 17 and under to, to legal hunting age so you can you can give them if you draw a deer tag you can transfer that deer tag to them and they can go hunt on it grandparents or parents can transfer tags to their immediate grandchildren or child and so i just wanted to throw that out there with a with a hunts just around the corner mom draws a tag uh susan is little susie didn't mom can transfer her tag to her or little johnny if she wants or dad can dad's got tied up in work and he can go hunting with grandpa dad can transfer his tag uh to, to his child or you can transfer it to your grandchild so i just wanted to throw that out there that that that's available it's just another way we're trying to uh uh help get youth uh fired up about hunting and i know that you know uh, my wife put in for tags this year. Um, she's harvested a lot of deer, a lot of elk, depending on which tag, <laughs> who draws. She, she, we, we've actually talked about doing that with our son that's still at home. And so, uh, unless it's a really good tag and then I don't think she'll give it up. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have to tease her about that, but she, she likes getting out there and hunting. So, but if it, it's a good way to keep your kids active in hunting. There's another item here on the list, and we saved it for last because last summer it was a, it was exciting stuff. Uh, take me fishing events. This is going to be uh, for for the kids and for a lot of people around uh, Southern Idaho. This is a really really big deal when it comes summertime. You know, it, it, this has been so fun. This take me fishing trailer, and to let people know what the take me fishing trailer is is. If you show up at one of our Take Me Fishing events, which are typically every Wednesday and every Saturday somewhere in the Magic Valley, you don't. We have fishing poles, we have night craw crawlers, we have crews on hand to help keep your poles functioning. Show up and go fishing without a fishing license for that day. For that day at that event, if you sign in, you can fish for free that day. And it's just a way we're trying to give back a little. We're also trying to teach people how to fish. We get tons of first-time fishermen. If you've never fished before, you have no idea. Um, Bob Erickson, he runs my my trout uh, trout trailer, I call it, but it's my Take Me Fishing trailer. They just were at uh, Dog Creek Reservoir up uh, north of Gooding yesterday, out in the middle of the desert. 90 people showed up. It was awesome. You know, we have 150 fishing poles on, on board. So we're going to be at Hagerman Oster 1 on the 18th this Saturday. Then we'll be on at Durkee's Lake on the 22nd. All our events are from 8 to noon. Try to get people out there early in the morning when the fishing's a little bit better. Um, you can go out and go fishing and uh, learn about it. Um, and then once you kind of gain those skills, then it's a, it's a good economical way to just go out and have fun with your family. You know, fishing is one, of, hunting is a kind of a, a tool essential sport, you know, and it can be cost prohibitive, prohibitive to some people, um, and, or to anybody it can, because you got gas for your truck and rifles and ammunition or archery equipment. And so it can get pretty pre expensive. Anybody can fish for about 20 bucks. You know, you still got a little fuel, but you can take the family sedan to most of our fishing places. And what we do is we've got all these different ponds across the state. If you go to fishinggame.idaho.gov again, click on the Take Me Fishing trailer, click on Magic Valley. It'll show all the events we have. We've got trailers around the state. So if you're visiting other parts of the state and want to try something, click on their website too and check it out. I know that when we were kids, uh, there'd be guys in the neighborhood, but we had a stream called Griffith Creek that ran by or through town and they would just simply pull a branch off a tree, tie a string to it. And sometimes that, that's how they would fish. Oh, you bet. And so once you, you know, it, it, you're right. If you're going out hunting, you got to outfit yourself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you need some serious training too as well. And, yeah. But even when I got a little older, we, we, we could buy bamboo poles for next to nothing, nothing and still use those. And you had a lot more reach, of course, with those. You bet. And that, that the one thing that, that I'll say, though, I, I used to do some fly fishing when I was young. There's a skill involved in that, and then I didn't do it for about a dozen years. And when I went back out and did it again, I had difficulty because, you know, casting is not it, it, it's not as easy as it looks. No, it isn't. 
But, you know, that's the fun thing about fishing. I mean, you can get as gear-headed as you want. It's just like golf. I mean, you could buy a million dollars worth of different gear just to have the newfangled thing. But you can you can fish with a, a tree branch, soda pop can with wire, I mean, line wrapped around it. Just do the old flip you know, out there in the lake. And um, it, 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 it's fun. I want to tell you something that was really interesting, Bill, at, at our a lot of our events. Who do you think shows up on a Wednesday? Who do you think shows up? That's our biggest day. Wednesdays are our biggest fishing day. I bet you see a lot of moms out there. Moms with kids because their husbands are busy at work. They golf um, on weekends. They don't have. They don't take the kids out and, and teach them fishing. Mom went fishing with dad when she was little. She wants to introduce her children to that. We have a ton of mothers with their children uh, that get out there. And so I, I guess I'm throwing a challenge out there. Dads, get out there and take those kids fishing with your wife. Um, get out there and have some fun. It, it's great. Kids don't fish 95% of the time. They're chasing frogs. They're chasing bugs. They're getting dirty. Your kids are going to get, they love it. It gets them unwired, unplugged, gets them sunburnt and bug bit. It, it's just fun. Get them outside and have some fun. I can remember when I was a kid, my dad gave, he wasn't generous, but he gave my brother and I both boats. Uh, they were older boats, but, you know, wooden, and and we could both have a boat to go fishing in. And if you got up early enough in the morning, on a summer morning, and you could row out, and, and uh, then you could just, the, the relaxation of that sometimes, sometimes you're out there for hours, but if you don't have anywhere to go, it's a great way to spend a, a Saturday morning or even a summer morning. You know, th- there's nothing better than that. You know, I, I mean, I grew up in the same way, you know, we had opening day of fishing, I'd run out, move my pipe, and then I'd hit the creek. Because usually by, uh, you know, it was usually Labor Day week, or Memorial Day weekend was opening day when I was growing up and drove me nuts when we had the irrigation water going, because I wasn't going to be able to get out there at sunlight, you know, and um, we've really lost a lot of that, you know, that was our fun, that was activity, and it's, you know, it's not a three hundred or four hundred dollar Nintendo set, you know, that's in the basement in a dark corner. Um, you can get those kids if it's, that's driving you nuts, get them out, let them go fishing. The one thing though that I would recommend, and we didn't think about this forty some years ago, is I'd go out there without a life jacket, and I'd be out <laughs> on a deep channel uh, on the lake sometimes fishing. And so today I would just recommend if you're gonna if you, the kids are going out alone at least to provide them with one of those things too as well. Oh, you bet. You need to have have their safety. That's one thing I've noticed. Our parents, I don't know if they're trying to get rid of us or, if they, <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, here's a motorcycle. Go have fun. <laughs> you know, oh, but you don't need that helmet. You know, or here's the back seat of a car. Lay in the back window. Um, so it's it was <laughs> we didn't do the seat belts. You didn't do the life vest. But you know, yeah, get out there, little sunscreen, bug dope, life vest if they're out boating. And you're ready to go for the day. Take a sandwich. There's just nothing better than to get out and catch a few fish. You get a nice table fare when you get home. People don't like trout. I find um, a, a killer trout recipe. Promise you, fillet the fish. Uh, take the the rib bones out. Sprinkle a little seasonal salt on it. Put some ranch salad dressing on it. Cook it for about 10 minutes on your barbecue grill on a piece of tin foil. You won't even know that it's trout. It, I, I, I don't like it like that because I love fish. Uh, but you can feed that to, and everybody goes, well, that's really good. That tastes like chicken. No, <laughs> I'm joking, but it tastes really good. And I would recommend 25 minutes before you put the trout on the grill, wrap up some corn on the cob in foil, Put that right down in the coals, yeah. and then when your trout is done, you pull that corn out too, so you'll have that hot, fresh corn on the cob along with that trout. trout. That mm. is heavenly. A, a meal fit for a king yeah. or an angler. <laughs> of course, <laughs> the, the king needs a little dental floss afterwards, but uh, it is. It, it, I'll tell you what, that, that summer evenings, we used to do that, um, and with panfish too. Oh, yeah. And, and, and we do have, that's one thing I was going to tell folks, we do have... Uh, down at the Oster Ponds, the the Riley Ponds, um, we've just gone in. We've cleaned them all up. We are putting fishing docks out in them right now. Great bluegill bass fisheries down there. One thing the Magic Valley's kind of we've got uh, we've kind of been lacking is some of those warm water fisheries. Um, 
Hagerman, we're really getting there. So if you want to take the kids down and have a fish that likes to bite, take them bluegill fishing. I want to thank Kelton Hatch for coming by, and we'll see you again sometime in July. You bet. Uh, maybe a couple of times. Maybe, who knows? yeah. And uh, that's uh, that's on the way for those folks who didn't get in today. And if you have a question, of course, hey, quickly, if they have a question and they didn't get to you on the air today, what should they do? Just feel free and call us. Uh, we've got staff on hand. Uh, we have what we call as a duty officer, someone, one of the staff that sits down front, and and our front office staff is incredible. Just call us at five three nine oh four. I mean. 324-4359-324-4359 and ask any question. You can get a hold of me or any of the other people on staff. I want to thank Kelton for coming by today. Rush Limbaugh is up next following the Fox News at 10 o'clock. And God willing, if the creek don't rise, I'll get to do this all over again tomorrow morning.